All right, in 1865, a guy by the name of Phillips Brooks traveled to what's now Israel. It was Israel that is called Palestine at the time. We call it the Holy Land. It's uh, the ancient home of the Jewish people, now Israel. Israel then and Israel now. He traveled during that trip, of course, as people do when they go to the Holy Land, to Bethlehem. And it was also right around Christmas time, and um, he saw actual shepherds there as well, just as some of you saw this morning, driving down the street. And it led him to, and he also was musical, and so he wrote a song which we know as, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Now, in the third verse of this song uh, are the words that I want to put up here for us, and then, then we're going to sing them together, all right? So if you know, the, you know the tune to A Little Town of Bethlehem, let's sing this verse together. I'll try to start you here. How silently, how silently this wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of His hand. No ear may hear His coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive Him still, the dear Christ enters in. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> Our problem is we don't want to be meek. Meek has all kinds of negative connotations to our minds. It means timid. It means overly submissive. Positively, it can mean gentle. It can mean docile, modest, compliant, mild, quiet, lowly, weak, or fearful. And so when we sing those words where meek souls will receive them still, we, him still, we kind of um, say, yeah, that's nice for people who are weak, but I don't think I need that. Another word which is, was never used in a bad sense, it's actually a, a biblical word, and it's been lifted to a little higher plane in the New Testament. Whenever you see the word meek translated in English, it's, it's a Greek word which um, primary meaning was mild or gentle. It was applied to inanimate things like a light wind or a meek wind or, or a, a, a light sound or a meek sickness. It was also used, of all things, as a horse who was meek or gentle. Therefore, it came to mean strength under control. Now, when we think of it in those terms, it has a little better connotation to us, but we put that together, the English meaning and, uh, with meek and positively means to be gentle and humble, to have strength under control, to be a, want, to be a person who understands the limits of human strength, that, that, you know what, as strong as I might be physically or emotionally or any other way, I, I, I still lack something. Now, here's what the message is about today. We're in Luke chapter 2. Mary, Joseph, and we're going to introduce two people, Simeon and Anna, demonstrate the kind of humility that precedes and accompanies genuine faith. I don't know where you are today as you come to this Christmas Eve service in your relationship with Christ, but we know from Scripture that this is a relationship of faith. And by faith, we do not mean that we throw our brains out the window and believe something we know cannot be true. By faith, we mean that we believe something that has a lot of evidence behind it but can't be totally proved. Can't be beyond human understanding proved. And yet we believe it. We have faith. The purpose of this message is this. To persuade those of you who may not yet be convinced that the events of Christmas lead logically and necessarily to a response either of humble repentance and faith or an arrogant and complete rejection of the message behind the events. Here's, you know, if, you've been, if you've listened to me long enough, you know, you know this. We are not here for religion for religion's sake. 
Religion for religion's sake, frankly, is not all that great of a thing. And religion, in the case of man trying to reach God or having a point of view of who God is, has led to a lot of bad things on earth. But genuine faith has led to some of the best things that we will ever see on the face of this earth. Those who truly understand who Jesus is and what he came to do for us. The message of Christmas is really can be stated in two sentences that the angels uh, mention as they appear to the shepherds, and it's this. The angel said to them, to the shepherds who were just down the street, the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, Savior who is Christ the Lord. Again, if you've listened to me or if you've been here for a while, there are all kinds of ways that Jesus could have been introduced by the angels that night. He could have been introduced as a great man. He could have been introduced even as the Son of God, which he certainly was. He could have been introduced as a great leader, a great inspiration, a great example. He was introduced by none of those things. The word used was Savior. That is... The best news that we could ever get as human beings, that is if you understand that you need a Savior, if, however, you feel that a Savior is not necessary to you, it's offensive news. It's news, oh, I don't need a Savior. Who, is the Bible, who are the Bible writers tell me that I need a Savior? But that's the message. And we can't change it. It, it. it is there. So here we go. First point is this, and I'll try to get you out of here in decent time this morning. <laughs> the humility of Mary and Joseph <laughs> humility of Mary and Joseph led to obedience. Now, Charles preached from the first 20 verses of chapter 2 last week. This is a continuation of it, and it's part of the Christmas story that doesn't often get preached about. That's why I'm doing it this morning. Here's how it starts in verse 21. At the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. Now Luke, the writer of this gospel, wants to make it clear that the parents of Jesus took their faith seriously. They were obedient uh, to what they knew God wanted them to do, and they fulfilled a number of things that were required by good Jewish parents at this time and in this place. There were three obligations that Mary and Joseph were fulfilling here. The first one was the obligation and the right of circumcision. Church is the only place you get to talk about circumcision, you know, and all of that. So it's, it was a Jewish right, a circumcised male babies. It, and, and it was done on the eighth day. Specifically, I want to note here that that was the time that they officially named the child. Now, naming children in this culture was the right of the, of the papa, all right? The, the, the papa, he got to name the children. Joseph, who was reported to be the papa, did not get to name this one. But he was humble enough to follow through on the name that was given by the angel to Mary for this child. The father had naming rights. But in chapter 1, verse 31 of Luke, by the way, Luke who wrote all of these down, and, and the reason that I preach about this this morning is because Christmas and the story, and, 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 and it's come down to us now for over 2,000 years, and, and we tend to think of it as, unless, unless there's true faith, as legend, as a nice story, as kind of a fairy tale, right? Because it has angels in it, it has things like that. But the guy who wrote this was Luke. He was a physician. He wrote not only this gospel, but the book of Acts. And we've just spent three years on the book of Acts in this church. Luke was a first-rate historian. He's not going to include details that didn't happen. 
And so he includes these. And, and when we look at details of it, we, the, the legendary things start to wear off. We start to see there's something much more important going on here. So at the time of circumcision, they named him. In chapter 1, verse 31, the angel saying to Mary, You shall conceive in your womb and give birth to a son. You shall call his name Jesus. And in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, the angel let Joseph in on it, which was a nice thing for Mary. Because when she, you know, the angel said, you're going to have a child, she said, wait a minute, I'm a virgin. Yes, you are. But the Holy Spirit's going to oversee it. So, so Joseph, but, and, and the angel did not tell Mary who was going to explain this to everyone. In fact, we know from the Gospels sort of between the lines that Jesus was considered by many people living in Nazareth as an illegitimate child. That, that there are all kinds of hints in there that that's how he was thought of in his own community. So they said, you're going to name him Jesus. Now Jesus, which is of course the anglicized view of this, is the Hebrew word, those of you, most of you know it, what is it? Yeshua. Yeshua, it's, it's Joshua. It's the same, it's the same name. It means the Lord is salvation. In fact, whenever you see a Hebrew name with Yah on the end of it, that is the personal, it's, it's part of the personal name for God, Yahweh. And so Yeshua, the Lord, is salvation. It, it also suggests deliverance. In other words, you're in trouble. You need to be delivered of something. And so that's the name that Jesus was given. So he's introduced as Savior, and his very name means one who delivers, one who saves. So right there, that tells you a lot about him. And if you believe it, it tells us a lot about us, that we were needing somebody like this to deliver us, to save us. The other right was the right of purification following childbirth. So there was circumcision on the eighth day, but if the child was a male, and then there was another 33-day period for the mom to go through purification because it just took that long because of blood and all that kind of stuff, couldn't enter the temple. So the rights for the mother to, to be able to come back to temple worship, ordinarily a 33-day period, and ordinarily a lamb would be offered at this time, but if you were poor, which apparently Joseph's carpenter business had not taken off yet, <laughs> then you could offer two turtle doves and, and two pigeons. And that, that's what Mary and Joseph offered for the purification rite. The third thing being for, performed was a dedication, just as we did today, of the first child in the family to be dedicated to God. The idea was, we're bringing this child, God, this child is yours. And then there would be a redemption price paid or a sacrifice to say, okay, but we get to raise him, in a sense. And, 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 and in a sense, buying the child. The, the whole idea was a reminder for the nation of Israel and to all parents, very much what we did this morning. This child was blessed to you by God. And so they went through these rites, and, and that's what they did. Now, for those of you visiting, I think a picture is worth at least a thousand words. With, with me, you get both the picture and the thousand words. So, <laughs> let's show you the picture. Just uh, And again, the reason I do this, the reason I do this is because most of us do not live in a New Testament world. We live in our world. And pictures help us to at least understand the setting of what was going on here. So this is a, 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 an aerial view, as it were, of the, of the city of Jerusalem during the time of Jesus. Now you will notice right here is the temple complex. For, for those of you who have been listening to me for so long, how big is that? How many acres? Forty. It's a 40-acre complex. It is more than just a little tent. All right, It's a 40-acre complex, and by the time of Jesus... Uh, Herod the Great had rebuilt large sections of it. It was an incredible edifice. It was the most beautiful thing of Jerusalem. And obviously it dominated the city. And so everybody would come there. So when they brought Jesus to the temple to be dedicated, they would come past there. Well, God, show me the next slide, because that's actually a better view. So this is the temple complex. So Mary and Joseph probably would have come up these steps here on the, um, uh, the, the southern end of the complex come in through here this was called the court of the Gentiles here so if you're a Gentile you could come this far 
but then you hit this barrier wall, and you better not go past that. In fact, I, I, I saw that there were signs posted all over it, that said, in essence, if you're Gentile and you come past this wall, you will have only yourself to blame for your ensuing death. So they took it pretty seriously. And that's why the symbolism, and Paul mentions it, that Christ has torn down the dividing wall. That's the wall he was talking about. So Mary and Joseph, however, being Jewish, could confidently walk through this wall and come up here to the temple area to the priest in order to dedicate Jesus. So this was, this was the court of women, and then you could come in this far. This, of course, was the Holy of Holies here. Only a priest went in there one time a year on the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. So that's the setting. Jesus was dedicated. Now, to dedicate him, to do this, in this, probably this area here, there were a lot of, there was a pillared, a, a pillared, you know, um, patio area. And, and that's where all of the money changers and the people who, so they didn't bring turtle doves and lambs with them from Nazareth because that's 60 miles away. They were in Bethlehem, which was only four miles away, so they came from, so the, you could buy a lamb or a turtle dove or a pigeon here. Now, to buy a lamb or a turtle dove or pigeon, you couldn't use Roman coinage. You had to use Hebrew shekels. Therefore, you would have to do what Leslie and I had to do when we went to Ukraine. We had to exchange money. You had to get the currency that worked there. And so they'd have to exchange shekel, the, their Roman currency for shekels. With the shekels, they bought the turtle doves. Now, next slide. 30, 30 years later or so, Jesus was not amused at the robbery going on there. And it's kind of interesting that, that uh, as he was dedicated there, 30 years later he said, look, you guys are ripping people off in this business you've done here in the temple area. God is not amused by making a buck off his name this way. It's ironic, isn't it? So Jesus, and, and, and the point to be made here was his parents took their faith seri seriously. They were obedient in everything they understood they needed to do. They were, but they didn't let their religion get in the way of their faith. Jesus, while he was sinless, was not, frankly, all that, all that careful at keeping all the man-made rules that were part of his, quote, religion and Judaism. He understood the difference between the two, and we're going to see that as the theme all throughout here. The whole point is that Joseph and Mary took their relationship with God seriously. They were humble enough to recognize that. Mary was humble and trusting God enough that she saw being pregnant before she was married as a great blessing and didn't even question the angel about who would explain things to Joseph, to her family, to her community. Joseph was humble enough to give up his naming rights of the child. All right, second point. The humility of Simeon led to a spirit-filled trust, recognition, recognition, and insight. So here's a guy named Simeon. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. What does Christ mean, class? Messiah. It means anointed one. So when we say the Lord Jesus Christ, there are two titles and one name there. First title is Lord. His name is Jesus, Yeshua, Hamashiach, Christ in Greek. Christos, the anointed one. So we have two titles and a name. It's not his first, second, first, middle, and last names. All right? It was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought the child to Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your... There's that word again. That you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child 
is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Starts out great, doesn't it? Yeah, Simeon, what a drag you are. Why did you have to bring up the last part? If you could have just stopped. All right, Siri thinks I'm talking to her. Right? Okay, here we go. Simeon is described as righteous and devout. What righteous means is that he was one who treated other people well. He was righteous in his dealings with people and in, in the way he conducted his life in a right way, in accordance with God's law. He was also devout, which means he was careful in his duties towards God. People would look at him and would consider him religious, but as we will see later, it, it went much deeper than that than just being religious for Simeon. But looking from the outside, he was one who was probably at temple all the time. He was offering the sacrifices as any good Jewish man would, but they meant something to him. They were not simply a ritual, something he did in order to make God like him. It says he was looking forward to the consolation of Israel. This, he was looking forward to the time of the Messiah. There are all kinds of Old Testament prophecies, and by the way, we'll be starting the book of Daniel here on Sunday mornings uh, in the middle of February. All kinds of prophecies available to the Jewish people to let them know that the time was near, if they were paying attention. Simeon was, and so he knew that something special was about to happen or should be about to happen, and it would lead, hopefully, to the comfort of Israel. It says that he was re it was revealed to them by the Holy Spirit that he would not die until he had seen the Messiah, and he was an old man now. Now, this took some trust. I mean, he had to be thinking, well, man, I see hundreds of babies come through here. None of them. None of them have been the Messiah. God, I'm getting old. It's kind of the same thing that Abraham had to have gone through. You're going to have a child. Yeah, right, I'm 100 years old. You're going to have a child. So he's looking for him, looking for him, looking for him. And besides the fact that he was getting old, there had been a 400-year silence. There had been no prophecies. And Luke is making it very clear that all of a sudden there's going to be an explosion of prophetic words happening here because Jesus was here. There had been a 400-year silence in Israel concerning prophetic words. In other words, where's God? We're not hearing much from him. Not only that, but politically Israel had been dominated. First by Babylon, which led to the deportation, and then they came back, and then by the Medes and the Persians, and then by, in between the Old and New Testament, by the Greeks, Alexander the Great, and then he died, and it was divided in four parts. And then the Romans. Israel was a minor place, and yet in a very significant location on the face of the earth. It still is. Isn't that amazing? Why the, why the current furor over Israel? You tell me. <laughs> it had been dominated. And so to be looking for the consolation place had been dominated all these years. And it was trust because we do not know when the Spirit revealed to Simeon, this is going to happen, but whenever it was now, again, he's an old man. But that day, through the Holy Spirit, he recognized, oh, this is it. There was nothing physically, apparently, about Jesus. There was no halos over Mary and Joseph and Jesus as they entered the temple that day. But Simeon recognized through the Holy Spirit that this was him. This was it. He was finally here. This baby is something special. Now, when you're not so full of yourself, you are a lot more observant of what's happening around you. And that kind of describes Simeon. He took Jesus in his arms, and he blessed him. And he didn't even ask the parents, apparently. He, just, he went to him, said, this is the one. He, there are a few things he said under inspiration. He said, my eyes have seen your salvation. And, and notice the continuation of that term. And he said, this is going to be a light of revelation for the Gentiles. That's, in, unless you're Jewish here this morning, that's you and I. In that world, if you're Jewish, there were Jewish people and Gentiles. That was it. Gentiles and everybody else. So this is going to be a light of revelation for the Gentiles because they didn't have... Um, culturally, the Word of God. And then he prophesied, and this is extremely important because it's a resumption of prophecy, as I've said, and, 
And this prophecy must have, must have seemed very strange, even to Simeon, because he had no doubt expected whatever he had to say to be all positive stuff about Israel resuming its place of influence in the world and the Messiah reestablishing the line of David and Israel. But what he actually said must have sounded strange to him coming out of his mouth and, and really strange to Mary and Joseph. So after he said, I've finally seen your salvation, he says this, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel. A couple of important words there, fall and rise. Fall is a word that doesn't just mean physically falling, it means morally falling and in every other way falling. You tripped up, you messed up. Rising is the same word from which we get resurrection. So this child is destined for the falling, or in other words, the total tripping up, missing the point of many in Israel, but also for the rising of many, those who would recognize who he is and respond appropriately to who he was. In a sense, it would be like a resurrection. It's the same word used there. It refers both to moral and spiritual falling and rising, and, and it refers to who Jesus was. In other words, your response to him, according to Scripture, not to me, determines what happens with you eternally. Now that is a pretty radical statement to make, and it's, it, frankly, it's so radical that it, you can't just mildly believe it or dismiss it. It's, it's, it's one of those things you either have to embrace or to totally repudiate. There's no middle ground with this. In John 14, 6, Jesus speaking says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In Luke 12, 8 through 9, Jesus speaking again says, And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will acknowledge before the angels of God. And the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. In other words, Jesus thought what you thought about him was going to determine your eternal destiny. Now, I don't know about you, but if I said stuff like that, you'd want to lock me up, and rightly so. The only way we can escape this is to say that Jesus never said those words. But if he did say them, and I think the evidence points to very strongly that he did, then we've got to deal with them if we have any respect for Jesus at all. He was, as C.S. Lewis said, he's this, he's this guy who we, we want to say was a great leader and a great inspiration and a great man, blah, 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 a great teacher. But we don't want to embrace him as who he said he was, which is the Son of God, and, ba and by the way, what you think about me will determine your eternal death. That's, that sounds awfully arrogant for a guy that we think was a nice guy. So clearly he was more than that. That's why Simeon said he's assigned to be opposed because a lot of people would oppose him. A lot of people still oppose, oppose him. You have to take him one way or the other. There's no middle ground. He did not leave that open to us. So he's assigned to be opposed. The miracle and the resurrection is that sign. And he says to Mary, and I think he looked directly at her there, and by the way, Mary, a sword will pierce your soul. Now, that sounds bad enough, right? In Greek, there were three different words that Luke could have used to describe sword. The word he used was the word romphia. And a romphia is a large broadsword, the kind of sword that you frankly chop people's heads off with. It was not just a little, little knife, and it wasn't even the Roman sword, the kind of sword they used in their, their armor, which Paul uses in Ephesians. It, it was a much larger sword. In other words, Simeon saying to Mary, you're going to be emotionally destroyed over what's happening, what's going to happen with this child who's bringing so much joy right now. And then the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. That is who Jesus is, according to Simeon through the Holy Spirit and according to Jesus in his own word. Third point of the message is this. Humility leads to profound thankfulness. There was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel. It, I, I love Phanuel. You'd never known about him unless he was here, right? We don't even know anything about him. But the readers must have known something about him. Daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. 
She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak to him, uh, speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. So again, in that temple complex, here comes Simeon, the old man. Ah, oh, the Messiah, he blesses him and then says, by the way, this, there's going to be some bad news here too. And then this, Anna comes up. And it's, again, a very devout figure called a prophetess. Uh, she was very old. She was at least 84. There were some, some scholars who believe that a better translation of this text is that she had been a widow for 84 years, making her, depending on when she got married, of course, at least approaching 100, if not older. In any case, very old. So here are these two old people, ignored pretty much by everyone else, just as shepherds were pretty much ignored by the religious elite in Jerusalem, and yet they were the ones who got who got the visit from the angels. She, like Simeon, was very devout. She recognized what she had been longing for all of these years was finally here, and she gave thanks. She gave thanks. She's an old woman, and, she, and her, her social life was to hang out at the temple. She had no husband for all of these years, and that was a devastating thing in that culture at that time in that place. Unless you had somebody who was going to watch out for you, take care of you, it was, it was a very tough existence. The sad part of the story is that Simeon and Anna were the exception rather than the rule in Israel. Most people missed it. They didn't recognize or couldn't believe that Jesus was really the one. He was too ordinary looking, and later on, while he never sinned, he did break some silly human religious rules, and he seemed to enjoy breaking them. Oh, I can't heal on the Sabbath? Watch me. There's a quote attributed to Mark Twain, although it's more likely it was credited to the novelist Grant Allen. I have never let my schooling interfere with my education. <laughs> Simeon and Anna, and I would also add Mary and Joseph, were ones who did not let their religion get in the way of their faith. But no matter how religious we are, no matter how humble we try to make ourselves, we can never be religious enough or humble enough to obtain eternal life according to Scripture. You still need a Savior. And if you've missed that point through Luke chapter 2, you've missed the whole ball of wax. It's the true meaning of Christmas. I mean, everybody talks, what's the true meaning of Christmas? Well, it's giving, it's love. It's, yeah, it's all of those things, but it is... The introduction to the world of a Savior. A Savior came. And so the trick is to accept His humility and sacrifice as your own. To recognize you're a little bit bankrupt related to this stuff. And that you need a Savior. So the fourth point is this. You accept the humility of Jesus as your own. There's a great passage from Philippians chapter 2. It's actually a song. It was an ancient song. Sung about Jesus. Paul was writing this to this church in Philippi that had just gotten started, and he was trying to get the people to get along with each other. <laughs> and so he said, look, I want you to have the same attitude that was in Jesus. And then he quoted this song, which, which is a tremendous theological statement, but Paul was using it just so the people would understand, look, take this attitude. Here's what he wrote. I want you to have the same attitude in Jesus. Starting at verse 8, and Paul writes, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped or to, to, to be clung at. But he emptied himself. And being found in human form, he humbled himself. Here's the quote now from verse 8. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Paul's intent in writing that to the Philippians was saying, look, have this attitude that Jesus had in you. In other words, be humble. Consider others as, as important as you, if not more important. But please remember that there's somebody a whole lot more important than you in this, and, and his name is Jesus. And if he humbled himself, then, then what does that say for you and I in our relationships with each other? Peter, 
writing on the same subject of humility, said this, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. You can't humble yourself enough. You need a Savior. You need Jesus to do that. So you accept His humility as your own, His sacrifice as your own. That's how to look at this. If Christmas is true, in other words, if, if the stuff we read about really happened, as defined in Scripture, then it means everything, doesn't it? I think it's pretty incredible. A much-needed Savior was born. If it's not true, frankly, it means nothing. Go home, unwrap presents, have a nice time. Although I might add, if Jesus didn't come, you probably wouldn't be opening presents, but that's another story, all right? If it is true, it means everything. If it's not true, it means nothing. It's just another religious practice done by human beings trying to get rid of a nagging sense of guilt that they feel before God they don't really know. So what about you and I? Will we be meek souls? Will we receive him who on that incredible night became, as Isaiah foretold 700 years ago before it happened, a virgin will conceive and give birth to a child, and he shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. As the worship team comes up, we're going to close this service. Here's what to do with this message. Accepting your need for a Savior is a humbling act. Because you're saying, I can't do it myself, I can't be religious enough, I can't do enough stuff. There can never be any assurance. So today, if the Holy Spirit has opened your heart, and that's who has to open your heart, I can't do it. If He has opened your heart to this understanding, then put aside your need to impress others and accept God's free gift of eternal life through His Son who came to this earth, who lived humbly, who taught, frankly, authoritatively, and distressingly to some, who died sacrificially, who rose victoriously to accomplish our salvation. Many of you know my story in this. As an 18-year-old college student trying to figure out whether I really believed this stuff or not, I was drawn to the resurrection of Jesus, saying to myself, if that happened, the whole ball of wax is true. And I just started reading. I, started, I, I looked at the details. I didn't just look at, quote, the legend. I looked at the details of the time and the place and became convinced, as much as I can see you here, that it happened. And since it happened, it was worthy of my faith. So I can tell you today, the reason I have faith is not because I was raised in it, which I was and am greatly thankful for, not because my mommy and daddy told me it was true, but because the Holy Spirit led me to a need to, to get the facts for myself. Your story may be different, but hopefully what this Christmas does, it will lead you to that, and I believe, I believe the inescapable conclusion that this is not a story to patronize, to to have on Christmas, you know, kind of a nice reverent thing going on for something that's ill-defined for you. But it is so important that it either must be embraced or it must be totally rejected. So the question is, where are you today? Let's bow for prayer. Father in heaven, this is a great gift you've given us, and yet, unfortunately, Lord, we're, we live our lives asleep too often. We're, we're blind to what's in front of us. We're blind to the reality that is around us. We're blind to the miraculous nature, not only of ourselves, but also this world. This world which is so beautiful and yet fallen 
And as we understand from Scripture, will one day be restored and fulfill every purpose for which you made it in the first place, along with us. And according to your word, you entered this world that you created. You didn't have to. You could have stayed distant, but you entered because we had a great need. We were destined for death, and you came to provide life. As it says in 1 John, a guy who saw you, who lived with you, who walked with you for three and a half years, this is the record. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Lord, I would like to gray that up a little bit sometimes. Emotionally, I would like to make it not so black and white. I would like to, to make a third path, but you didn't leave that open for me or anyone else in your word. So, Lord, I, I, I respect you, and frankly, I respect greatly what Jesus did for me. would never want to or could change it, and I certainly don't want to cheapen it by saying it wasn't enough or it didn't matter. And so, Lord, thank you for coming. Thank you for living. Thank you for going through agony for me. And thank you for your resurrection. We pray these things, Jesus, on this Christmas Eve morning. Amen.